Happy Father's Day. How are we doing today? Hey, I want to honor all of the fathers who are here today. So if you are a father of any kind, uh, I want to ask you just to stand just for a minute or so. Can you stand? Come on, don't be bashful. Yeah. All right, now stay standing for a second because uh, we, we want to take a moment to honor you guys and uh, thank you so much for all that you do for your families. We appreciate that. It's an essential part to uh, reaching the next generation uh, is through strong fathers, and so we're very thankful for that. Uh, we'd thought about doing a similar thing that we had done with uh, Mother's Day where we were going to have you rifle through your purse and see who could find uh, you know, a certain item first, but I figured you guys are probably like me and left your purse out in the, uh, in the car. So instead, what I want to do is I want to honor the newest father in the room. So if you have had another child, son or daughter, within the last six months, remain standing. Everybody else sit down. Okay, we got, there's three or four. Okay, uh, let's do last three months. Two months? One month. Two weeks? This guy back here? Come on up. When did you when did you have your kid? Still bacon. Oh, still bacon. No, I mean has been born. Oh, hasn't been born? Come on, man, you're breaking the rules. There you go. Thank you. Menard's gift card. <laughs> Give him a hand. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. Also, uh, it announced his first service, so I wanted, wanted to uh, say something to you guys, too. Um, it's funny because I just assume that everybody follows me on social media, so, you know, I'm just I'm narcissistic like that. I assume you all follow my life, so you know what's going on with me. Um, but apparently some of you don't, so I we wanted to announce something that was kind of cool. Uh, a few months back, like two, yeah, like two months back, uh, we got a call from our lawyer and our adoption lawyer, and, uh, of course, we'd not talked to her for, like, two years, and so I'm kind of thinking, like, oh, gosh, like, what's going on, like, did something happen with our birth mother? Because, like, we had adopted twins almost four years ago. In September, it'll be four years. And so we're like, what happened? Like, we're kind of freaking out. I'm like, man, I hope something didn't happen to uh, the birth mother. And then we find out, get the news that she is actually pregnant, due in July, and wants to know if we wanted to adopt him. It's a boy. And so before the day was even out, we made the decision that we were, I mean, because he would actually be biologically our girl's brother. And so, like, how could we say no to that? Because, I mean, years from now, do I really want to look them in the face and say, like, we could have adopted your brother and didn't? Like, to us, he was already a part of our family. So, like, that same day, before the day was even out, we said yes, called her back and said yes. We're like, hey, we're in it. And so uh, we're going to have another kid in less than a month. So, <laughs> I'm going to have a son. <laughs> first thing my brother told me whenever I, you know, called him, I was calling family and telling them, the first thing my brother said to me was, who's going to teach him to play sports? I'm like, come on. He'll know about Star Wars, that's for sure. God help us. Uh, one of the most life-changing experiences that I've ever had, besides being a father, uh, was the summer I spent doing camp ministry uh, in college. Between my junior and senior year, for my internship, for my degree, uh, I actually spent three months uh, up in the Northwoods in northern Wisconsin uh, doing camp ministry at a camp called Honey Rock Camp. And got to work with junior hires the whole summer, taking them on camping trips, teaching them all different kinds of woodland and life skills and, and things like that, all kind of centered around a Christian worldview. Very, very cool opportunity. Cool thing is, I actually didn't know how to do a lot of the things that I was supposed to teach them. Um, so you have, we had kind of like a crash course the first couple of weeks before the students got there where it's like, hey, it might be a good idea if you actually know what you're doing before you, you know, are instruct. Um, bless you. Uh, before I had, you know, had to instruct these kids on how to do it. And so I got to learn things like horseback riding, water skiing, uh, archery, marksmanship, basic skills like how to make a fire without using matches, how to tell what time it was to, 
to a 15-minute accuracy just by looking at the sun, like by the position of the sun in the sky. I wish that, like, nothing impresses a group of junior hires more than to be able to tell them, like, uh, it seems like it's about 8.30. And then they, like, look at the watch, and they're like, oh, my gosh, how'd you do that? I'm like, magic. Because <laughs> I never told them the secret of how you learn how to do that. But anyway, uh, there was this one kid in our group who uh, was the younger brother of another counselor. I, I went to school with him, and so his family, I guess, went to Honey Rock every year. And so his younger brother was in seventh grade, and so they were going. Of course, for these camping trips, you're out there for three days at a time. I mean, we're just roughing at tents and fires and all that kind of thing. So for three days, we're out on this camping trip. And you learn a lot about people that you're kind of living in a tent with for three days. And so this, little, this kid was so cool because I found out that his whole family actually spoke German at home. Like, they speak English as their primary language, but their background was German, and their family always wanted that heritage to be passed on, so they only spoke German at home. So he's seventh grade, you know, 12, 13 years old, fluent in German. So, of course, then we started getting him, like, to teach us a bunch of random things in German. So, like, it was kind of a German crash course. And my favorite chief among them that I learned was, Luke, ich bin dein Vater. Are you surprised that I learned how to say, Luke, I am your father in German? I mean, you, you don't know me but at all if you wouldn't think that'd be the first thing that I'd learn. But one of the coolest things that I did while I was there was uh, a skill called orienteering. Anybody ever heard of orienteering before? It's a competitive activity in which you're supposed to navigate checkpoints in rugged terrain like the north woods of Wisconsin using only a map and a compass. You learn how to, like I learned how to read topography. Uh, like have you ever seen those like weird maps with all the squiggly lines that get like closer and further apart from each other? It shows elevation and so we learned how to read maps like that to know where, you know, w which routes to take and then so you'd learn distance and bearings and how far to go and for how long you're supposed to go on that bearing, all that type of stuff. And basically we would break up into teams and your group would have to try to orient yourself through this rugged terrain getting to the different checkpoints and to see who could get to the end of whatever the map was. Um, first. Now, most of the time, missing a checkpoint or getting lost was usually a result of human error. Like, I read the map wrong, or it was upside down, or I misjudged a distance, or I didn't quite translate the distance and bearing on the map and on the compass to actual life, and so you end up missing a point and kind of get lost and turned around. But sometimes, the compass would malfunction for reasons unknown, like, because, I mean, basically... The way compasses work is they work based on magnetic fields in the world, like kind of testing that where it always kind of point north so you can get a, a general idea of your bearing pretty accurately if you orient it the right way. And so things like if there's a large iron ore deposit, like in the ground nearby, that can actually cause fluctuations in magnetic fields. Uh, electronics can, like most of the time when we were out in the woods, there was no electronics allowed, so that wasn't really a problem. But even like a bad storm, like heavy cloud cover could actually affect, you know, magnetic variations, which could sometimes cause, uh, you know, the compass to its bearing to be off or something like that. And so because these fields change over time and for lots of reasons, compasses sometimes have to be reset and reoriented. It's a very delicate, sensitive tool that can easily malfunction and can lead you astray. And so I was thinking about this because the truth is, uh, in a lot of ways, the human conscience is kind of like a compass. It's very delicate, very sensitive, but can easily get off the mark. So sometimes, like a compass, the human conscience, it has to be reset it has to be reoriented. It has to be almost, in a sense, re-educated because of a lot of things, because of sin, because of our experiences, because of things that have happened to us or things that we have done. And so this is what we see as we're in this next chapter in the series we're doing called An Open Letter to the Church. The Apostle Paul is uh, writing to this uh, group of people, a church that he planted in a city called Corinth. And for them, I mean, they had experienced, you know, if you knew anything about Corinth, it was kind of the Las Vegas of the ancient world, surrounded by all sorts of decadence, temptation, and supposed freedom. But when they responded to the good news, they began to realize, you know, in a lot of ways, my compass is a little bit off. 
they realize that like our bearing is not pointing at the things that it should be pointing at. And in a lot of ways, our compass, our moral compass needs to be reset. It needs to be reorient, reoriented around things that matter. You know, rather than like what wider culture says is okay or acceptable, um, we need kind of our bearing set on the kingdom of God and the life and teachings of Jesus. And so they're writing to Paul in this letter, having all sorts of questions about, you know, we're dealing with this issue and that issue, and we're not much sure, sure to do here because you taught us all these things when you came and planted the church, but then when you left and began to move on to plant other churches, these other people came in, and they started telling us other stuff too, and it wasn't quite in line with what you had said, and so we find ourselves wondering, like, some people agreed with them, but then some, some of us still agree, agree with you, and so we've kind of become divided on some of these things, and we're not sure what to do. And so one of the most prevalent and reoccurring issues found, not just in the Bible, but specifically in uh, the letter of 1 Corinthians, is the issue of idolatry, the worship of other gods, specifically represented by some sort of statue, some sort of temple. And it was widespread in the ancient world. The Greeks and the Romans, their, their pantheon of gods uh, was, were widely worshipped, widely honored, widely revered in the ancient world. Um, oftentimes, uh, gods like Apollo, Zeus, Aphrodite, we've heard these names typically in more fairy tale type of things, but for them, it was a very real thing. It was a very real part of life. Those were the gods they had set to honor and revere by how they lived their lives. And so, since the Corinthians came out of such a culture, Paul is trying to reset their compass in a way around what they should value and what their lives should be pointed toward. And so, he's addressing this idea um, of idolatry, a specific idea around idolatry and around what should be normal in society in 1 Corinthians 8, starting in verse 1. He begins like this. He says, Now, about food sacrificed to idols. And I'm going to unpack that. I'll come back to that. He says, we all know that we all possess knowledge. So he's like quoting some of these teachers who are contradicting him. He says, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. But whoever loves God is known by God. So then, about e eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. But even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live." So, like I said, Paul is quoting these slogans of these false teachers because Paul taught some things around that, and then these other teachers come in, and they're teaching things that are, you know, just a few degrees off of what Paul had been teaching, and it was causing some confusion. And so they're wanting to know about this, this topic around idolatry, specifically food sacrifice to idols. Now, for some of you, that means absolutely nothing, so just quick little history lesson to bring us all on the same page. In the ancient world, the temples of Greek and Roman gods, though a place of worship and devotion to a particular deity, uh, were actually, funny enough, kind of considered almost like an archaic form of a restaurant in the ancient world. What you would do is you would bring your sacrifice to, you know, the temple of Apollo or the temple of Zeus or the temple of Aphrodite, uh, a goat or a bull or a cow or, you know, whatever the livestock was, and you would slaughter it as an offering to your God to appease their wrath or, you know, whatever you were hoping for, a, a good crop that year or something like that. And, there, and then literally you would sit and feast on that meal. They would cook it, and you would feast it there, and you would invite family and friends, and they would come. And sometimes even strangers, depending on how much food there was, would actually partake in these feastal meals within these pagan temples. Now, oftentimes there was so much meat left over that it would actually be sent to market uh, to be sold. So, therefore, it was very likely that any meat you bought at the marketplace, like raw meat to cook, came from a pagan temple came from, some, you know, these, wor these worship rituals to Zeus and whoever. So, for the local Jewish population, like for those who lived in what was called the diaspora, it was, uh, it's a Greek word for the dispersion, it was the, Gre it was the Jews who lived spread out across the Greco-Roman world. They didn't live in the promised land where most of the Jews lived, but they, spre they lived spread out in little communities 
in these Greek and Roman cities. And so for these Jewish people, like, this was a big deal because idolatry was a massive issue for them. If you read the Old Testament at all, you'll see, like, their primary hang-up in their relationship with God was worshiping other gods. They get caught up in worshiping the gods of the nations around them. And it got so bad that they actually got sent into exile out of their homeland for 40 years, for an entire generation kind of wiped out because of their infidelity to God. So when they came back from exile, they're thinking, never ever again. Idolatry will never be an issue with us as the people of God. We have learned our lesson. Exile taught us the cost of idolatry. So for the Jewish people, like in Jesus' time, idolatry was a huge no-no. Even the smallest whiff of idolatry would cause the religious leaders to just go into a frenzy because they knew the cost of what it was to worship other gods. So what these Jewish people would do when they found out, you know, like all this meat in the marketplace is most likely had been sacrificed to Zeus or whoever, many Jews actually became vegetarians because they said, I just don't even want to risk uh, even the smallest chance that I might ingest something that has been dedicated to another god because they viewed themselves as being polluted or somehow defiled from it. And so this new sect of Judaism that shows up on the scene, these followers of the way, the followers of Jesus, now they're facing a similar issue because they're in spreading through the Greco-Roman world, and now they're facing the same kind of question. Is eating meat that has been sacrificed to idols, is that participating in idolatry. And so this is where the false teachers begin to come in because many of these Corinthians who had come out of these kind of pagan backgrounds, like their conscience, their moral compass was very sensitive to this idea. Like they'd seen the dark rituals, they'd seen the evil things that came out of, you know, th that kind of pagan temple lifestyle. And so their conscience was very, very sensitive to those lifestyles. So there was a group within the church who were like, absolutely not, you cannot need, eat meat out of the marketplace. Like it's defiled by idols, and if you partake in it, uh, you're defiled by an idol. You cannot be a Christian and eat meat from the marketplace. Like that was kind of the stance that they were taking. And so these false teachers kind of come in, and they're presenting themselves as this enlightened, super spiritual, you know, type of people. And they're like, well, if you knew what we knew, if you had the freedom that we have, you would know that's not true. We have freedom in Christ. We can do whatever we want. It's okay. That you know there's no such thing. There are no other gods. There's only one God. You know, those idols are nothing. I mean, you can even, like, they got to the point where they said they were so free, they could even go to a local temple and partake in the temple feast, and they say, it doesn't affect us at all. There's no superstitious magical power with that. We're free in Christ, and that's all that matters. And so you see this kind of contention uh, build with this, and Paul's trying to address this in the chapter. And so this is how he responds. He responds in a way that walks a very fine line among these kind of two divisions where, first off, he agrees with them, the, false, the teachers, where he says, you're right. There is only one God, the Father. There is only one Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. And idols technically are nothing. There are no other gods. There's only one God. He talks a little bit more idolatry uh, about idolatry later in a chapter connecting it to some demonic stuff. But other than that, he's saying this meat that's in the, te you know, sold in market that was connected to the temple. He's like, technically, you're right. There is no superstitious power connected to it. And for a Christian to partake of that, as long as they're not partaking in the actual ritual itself, they're not in danger of contaminating themselves with idolatry. So he's like, in a lot of ways, you're right when you say that they're free to eat that meat. So he agrees with their knowledge, but then he lets them know what the real problem is. He says, you're right, but you're also wrong because you're not acting in love. He said, your knowledge has made you arrogant. That's why he says knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. He says, you, your supposed freedom and knowledge, your enlightenment has made you arrogant. It's made you proud, and you are not acting in love toward your brother. And he explains this more, verse 7. He says, but not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that they eat sacrifi sacrificial food. They think of it as having been sacrificed to a god. And since their conscience is weak, it's defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. 
So he addresses this idea that's a very difficult thing about the spiritual life. And I feel like there's, there's a certain amount of maturity that has to come with an understanding of how we navigate these tensions. Because he says to these leaders, like, yes, you have knowledge. And yes, technically that knowledge is true. But that's not the point. There are these brothers and sisters in Christ who have just come out of this darkness in idolatry not that long ago, and they are still sensitive to issues related around these things. So if you try to push your freedom on them and they're not ready for it, you risk them violating their own conscience. Because you see, and we're dealing with issues like this even now, questions of like, how we live in response to somebody else's conscience. Like, should I do something if it offends somebody else's conscience, or should I withhold from that? Like, how do we, like, because we live in a society where we say, like, uh, matters of conscience don't matter anymore. Like, just too bad for you. You need to deal with your own problem. How dare you transgress my rights? In a nutshell, what Paul is trying to say here is that oftentimes knowledge without love leads to an abuse of freedom. Knowledge without love, tempered with love, leads to an abuse of freedom. When you're more concerned with being right, with just being right, rather than loving right, it does a lot of damage. And because of this, there's all kinds of divisions, all kinds of issues and problems within the Corinthian church. Because this tension was not being managed well, people were not operating in love toward one another, that they were kind of firmly entrenching within their own divisions and camps and being in contention with each other. Now, granted, we don't worry about, in the modern world, this type of thing happening, right? Like, you don't... Uh, you never go to IGA, you never go to Nuxalls worried that accidentally you're going to buy meat that was sacrificed to Zeus or Apollo. Like, there's no ad in, at IGA saying, this weekend only, Father's Day special, Zeus burgers. Like, that doesn't happen. Like, we don't deal with that, right? We know that little statues, pagan temples are nothing. Any type of food related to any kind of superstitious power that might pollute you or contaminate you, it's not an issue to us, right? Blatant idolatry like that, at least in that form, doesn't apply to our time and culture in 21st century America, right? So I find myself asking with chapters like this, like, what's the best way could we possibly apply principles in this text that Paul's talking about? Like, are there issues in our world, in our time, in our culture, in the church where we're dealing with issues of freedom in Christ and dealing with people's rights and how we act toward each other that can be drawn from this chapter to apply today? I think there are. Probably more than one, but there's one circumstance that kind of sticks out to me and that I feel like today is an appropriate time to talk about it. And how this idea kind of spurred about was it, was an art, it came from an article that I was reading uh, a couple years ago. Uh, this was back in, I want to say, 2015. Uh, I was reading an article in 2015 where it listed the 10 drunkest counties in Illinois. And guess where we rated? Effingham County? We're number one. We're number one. Yeah, that year, Illinois... Effingham County, now remember, this is comparing to like Cook County and places like up in the Chicago area. Effingham County was listed as the drunkest county in Illinois. According to the county health rankings and roadmaps, Effingham County consumed alcohol more excessively than any other county in the state. The article showed that 31% of people in the county admitted to drinking excessively on a regular basis. 31%. That is almost one in three people in our county. So if you look to the person to your left and to your right, statistically speaking, more likely one of them is drunk right now. No, I'm just kidding. Some of you are like, hey, I'm from Cumberland County. Like, I'm from Shelby County. Like, don't count me in your statistics. But, like, I read that and I realize, like, this is an issue. And the thing is, like, within the church, the use and the misuse of alcohol, very divisive topic. I had, I had, some, I had somebody else tell me right after first service, they're like, oh, okay, you're going to talk about, pol you're gonna t I thought you were going to talk about politics, too, in that message. Like, just get in all the divisive stuff we can in one message. But, you know, from time to time, I have people ask me, they're like, Tyler, what's New Hope's stance on alcohol? And it's like, I would kind of struggle when people ask, like, what our stance is. Like, we're, like, choosing what our view is on. It's like, 
We don't have a stance. Like, we believe what the scriptures teach about it. And the scriptures actually have a pretty wide, diverse, pervasive view on alcohol. Like, on the one hand, Jesus turned water into wine at a wedding. First miracle he ever did. And he, and it's dispersed to the, the wedding crowd. And of course, they're like, oh, this is like the best wine we've ever had. And I just have a hard time thinking that Jesus is like, here's the best wine you've ever had, but don't drink it. It's wrong. Like, I just don't see that happening. In the Psalms, alcohol, wine, things like that are talked about as a, as a gift given from God to celebrate during feastal times. That was a, a part of feast life among the Jewish religious life. And there's even Paul, actually, from a medicinal standpoint, Paul actually commands Timothy in 1 Timothy 5, 23, where he says, you know, your stomach's been bothering you. Maybe have a glass of wine every once in a while, that there would actually be some benefits if you did that. So he said there's even some medicinal benefit to that at times under the right circumstances. So there's that side where Paul says, 1 Timothy 4, 4, that everything has been given and should, you know, from God and should be enjoyed by God because it's been, you know, by prayer and, con- you know, consecration of the word and that type of thing. It's like we should, things like this are given by God to enjoy. But on the other hand, consistently we see in passages like Ephesians 5, 18 that warns against intoxication and drunkenness, drinking in excess, saying like unequivocally, Without a doubt, it is sin. If you are drinking to the point of inebriation where you are affected by it, it is sin. Full stop, period. No way around it. Do not become drunk on much wine, for it leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Even beyond that, in writings like the Proverbs, it warns against the dangers of alcohol, the foolishness that can come with it, where it says, beer is a brawler, wine is a mocker. And it talks about the ease in which a person can lose control of their judgment and senses and make bad decisions under its influence. Leaders of prominent places, kings and governors, are warned in the Proverbs against partaking in strong drink because it steals their capacity to rule wisely and justly. You see, there's a balanced perspective within the scriptures. And guys, I can't tell you, even from a pastoral perspective, the number of times I've had people approach me privately and confess to addiction to alcohol. They didn't set out that way because nobody's ever like at the beginning of the year, like, hey, New Year's resolution, I think I'm going to become an alcoholic. That sounds like a good time. Like, no one chooses that. They either do it because they're pulled into social situations where that's culturally the norm or maybe it's kind of a narcotization where it's like, hey, I'm, I'm doing this just to get by rather than to get better. I'm stressed out or there's issues going on. And so I drink to numb myself from the pain. And before I realize it, I am now a slave to this thing. Didn't set out to be like that, but that's kind of how it becomes. And the thing is, a lot of these people who have approached me, these aren't down and out type of people like, you know, gutter of society, can't keep a job, you know, nobody wants anything to do with them type of thing. Like, rarely is it like that. Typically, it's people who are upstanding citizens, and it's hidden from everybody. And of course, left unchecked, I can't tell you how many times we've had to deal with situations like DUIs, domestic abuse, marital affairs, deception and doublespeak, within the family and within their job and within their social circles. And they become enslaved to this. Don't set out to do it. But the dangers and the pitfalls of alcohol, both from a pastoral, I mean, just the science of it, and biblically speaking, the dangers of it cannot be overstated. So back to my original question. When you consider the entire counsel of God, alcohol is something that when used, should be used with moderation, wisdom, Restraint, above all things, self control, not in isolation, meaning that you should not be the only one who decides if or when or how you use it. Sometimes it's a decision made in community, among family, among with, with a certain amount of accountability. And there are many times when circumstances call for it, it should be avoided, entire, avoided entirely. And because of the fine line of this topic, that there's a tension that is with, you know, held in Scripture over the centuries, groups in the church have handled this very differently. That there are some denominations, some traditions that 
view it as not a big deal that whether the tradition came out of, you know, maybe a European culture, which tends to be more of a wine culture, um, where alcohol is just kind of, pre you know, prevalently and commonly used, that it's not a big deal, even to the point that sometimes intoxication is not even viewed as that big of a deal. But then, of course, you have others who respond to situations like that, and even, I mean, some of the foundation of our own nation, the Puritans, like the Puritans taught, and some of you may have even come from a background similar to this, where they were taught that any use of alcohol, 100%, not just the abuse of it, but any use whatsoever is sinful, and it should be avoided entirely. And so then you could say things like, I just don't see how anybody could drink and still call themselves a Christian. There are some people from that tradition. People who are Christ followers, genuinely trying to follow God's word, have fallen on different ends of the spectrum, and some feel the freedom to partake, and others feel like it should be avoided entirely, and some people are in the middle. And understanding the appropriate use or lack of use of this, like food sacrificed to idols, has been a divisive issue in past generations, denominations, and even particular churches. And so Paul, he's trying to address this with the Corinthians, saying like, I know I'm walking a fine line here, and I know you want this like black and white, yes or no type of statement, but it's deeper than that. It's more important than that. It's more dealing with some soul issues of maturity than just do this or don't do this. And so he's trying to kind of flesh these ideas out, and in verse 9 he continues, and this is kind of the advice he gives to the Corinthians. He says, Be careful, however that the exercise of your rights. Now, that's a phrase we're very familiar with in our society. My rights, and how dare you tell me, and you know, like we live in a culture that is all about exerting our rights. He says, but be careful that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone with a weak conscience sees you with all of your knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died, remember, he's reminding them who they are. He says, this person you're in contention with, Jesus died for them too. Don't forget that. The number one way we refute arguments and people we disagree with is we start out by trying to dehumanize them, to make them somehow of less value than you are. Then it's easier to be vicious and tear them down and that type of thing. But Paul is reminding them, Christ died for this person too. This person you're disagreeing with, Christ died for them too. He said, is destroyed by your knowledge. When you, now notice what he says, when you sin against them in this way. So this isn't like just, ah, oh, to each his own, no big deal. No, he says, the way you're responding to this, you're actually sinning against your brother or sister in Christ by the way you respond. When you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. So it's not just the person. Like, Jesus is involved in this. Like, when you wrong this person, you're like, my rights, whatever, I don't care. That person, they're just going to have to deal with, that's their problem, not mine. He says that you are sinning against Jesus himself when you respond that way. Therefore, this is Paul's conclusion, therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause them to fall. And so he lays out this paradigm that was foreign to them, and it's increasingly becoming foreign in our culture as well, that he's saying, you know, if my freedom causes somebody else to struggle with this thing that maybe their conscience is a little bit sensitive to because of their past, because of things they've dealt with, because of the tradition they grew up, then I will give up that freedom temporarily out of love for them. See, Paul wanted the Corinthians to know that love is often expressed best by surrendering my rights for the sake of others. That's the way of the cross. Not like, oh, you can't tell me what to do. I'm going to do what I want. I got my rights. He's like, no, like the way of the cross is I love you more than my view and so I'll lay down what I think I have freedom to do, and I may have freedom to do. I can argue it from the Bible that I have freedom to do this or that, or whatever the circumstance is. But you know what? I'm going to lay that down just for a little bit because you matter to me more than my rights matter to me. 
because is that not the message of the cross? Did, was that not what the cross was about? Jesus laid down his rights. He did not deserve to die on a cross, but he let go of those and he said, no, I'll do what needs to be done because I care about you more than I care about my own rights. And so I'll, I'll sacrifici sacrificially and fully give myself away to you. Now, I know for some people that, you know, this, the personal struggle with, you know, drinking or whatever may not even be a personal thing. It may, may not even be like a, oh, I'm, I struggled with alcohol in the past and therefore I just never want to drink at all. It may be because of your tradition. It may be because of things, your own experience. Like I know some people that I've talked to here that, you know, they had parents or grandparents who were abusive alcoholics. They, all they ever saw was the dark consequences of alcohol being misused. And so for them, it's just like a non-starter. Like they don't, they don't deal with that tension well. Their past has shaped their conscience in a way that they can't manage that tension well. And so for them, it's just like a non-starter. And so they struggle to be around it. They definitely struggle to engage in it. And so it's very, very hard for them. And so what do you do with those people? Like, how do we respond in situations like that? Like, we need to be remindful, we need to be mindful that our freedoms, our rights, affect other people around us. Like, we kind of live in this, like, super individualistic, free culture where we think that, like, the things I do and the things I say, like, are somehow happening in a silo and they don't affect anybody else around me. But it's like, if you've had a family or been married or, you know, been in any kind of meaningful community for any period of time, you learn very quickly that everything you say and do affects people around you, right? We've all said and done things that have positively or negatively affected those around us, and so... I think a primary mark of maturity is learning to temper those decisions, those things we say, those things we do, being mindful. Not that you live your life just for what other people think. It's not about that. It's not like being a people pleaser or anything like that. But recognizing I don't just live unto myself, and so I need to be careful how I live. I need to be careful how I respond. And I think this is a unique, unique challenge for a place like New Hope because we're kind of a spiritual mutt aren't we? Van has said that over the years, and I love that. I feel like that is the best way when people, you know, kind of ask, like, well, like, well, hey, what's your tradition? What's your background? I'm like, I don't know. I'm whatever Jesus was. I don't know how to, like, I don't know how to answer that. I'm like, we're kind of, and I always say what Van says, like, we're kind of a spiritual mutt. We started out Baptist. I say we. I wasn't here at the time, but I joined the community, and we have people from Catholic backgrounds, and Pentecostal backgrounds, and Lutheran backgrounds, and Methodist backgrounds, and Christian church backgrounds. We have people that's, it's a very diverse church, which I believe then means that we have very diverse people who have very diverse views on a lot of things. And so that means, and we always teach this in our newcomers class, that like our primary philosophy is that we want to major on the majors and minor on the minors. Nothing causes greater division or greater struggle or problem within a community when something minor becomes major. We make a big issue about a very small thing. And so, like, I will go to bat and I will die on the hill of the, the divinity of Jesus Christ, like the fullness and divinity of Jesus Christ. Like, I'll die on that hill every single day. Or the divine inspiration of Scripture, I will fight that battle tooth and nail because it is an essential core part of Orthodox Christian faith. But something like my interpretation of revelation or the alcohol thing or whatever. It's like, I know there's a wide prevailing view on some of those things. I mean, Van and I don't even agree on revelation. Him and I differ on how we interpret some of those things. But what we can agree on is kind of the core foundational thing. And Van always says like this, and I love it. He says, when Jesus comes, I'm going. I'm like, hey, I can get on board with that. Like, I'm fine with that. But in terms of, you know, all the intricacies, like major on the majors— and minor on the minors. And so we have to learn how to extend grace to one another, I think, in how we approach these things, realizing we all have opinions, we all have thoughts, we all have things that kind of prick or tweak our conscience because of our backgrounds, because of the things we've experienced, because of the traditions we've come from. We have things that our conscience tends to lean toward maybe more than other people, so we are a little more passionate about it or more you know, strongly held opinion about it. But the question we constantly have to be asking is, what is the way of love in handling these things, and how do I extend grace to those who may differ from me? 
And of course, when I talk about these things, I'm not talking about core foundational things. Like when we can point to something in Scripture, and there are a lot of things in Scripture that are very black and white, I can say there's no qualm about this thing. I can point to the Scripture. That's one thing to have conviction around that. But when it's some of these secondary and tertiary things that it's like there's tension around some of these things, you can see verses and scriptures that back up various ideas that it's like, can we just extend some grace to not assume that my view is always the right view all the time, no matter what? Like, how arrogant is that? And that's why Paul said, knowledge puffs up, makes you arrogant, makes you proud. Love builds up. We always need to walk the way of love. And, and this is why this is a big deal, because matters of conscience, this is an important point, matters of conscience are not always matters of conviction of the Spirit. And for all the reasons that I just gave, because of your background, because of your tradition, because of things that you have done or things done to you, you may feel strongly about certain things because your compass, your conscience, your moral compass has been oriented around certain things because of unique experiences that you had and so a lot of times what we do is we baptize our opinions into a thus saith the Lord and say, well, that's God's will just because I feel strongly about it. Now, if you can point to Scripture and prove it irrefutably, then I'm all on board with it. And that's, a, I mean, conviction from the Spirit, from the Word, like that's amazing. But if it's personal opinion baptized into the will of God, man, that's damaging to a community. And we need to have more grace toward each other than living that out. So basically, Paul, and, and this is even how in verse 8 he says this. Um, he says, but food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. So he's kind of putting things in perspective, saying, like, we're arguing about is it this or this. But the truth is, like, you're missing the point if it's just about right or wrong, do it or don't do it. But it's more about the way we handle it is what matter, matters the most. Because some of them are all up in arms about, you know, food sacrificed to idols. You know, yeah, we can do this without, without qualm, no big deal. And these other people are viewing it as sinful. He said, basically, you each think your own conscience is right, and you assume the other has to change for you. But Paul's bigger point is that if neither side is acting in love, then neither side is right. That's dangerous. We've got to be careful of that. If one is forcing their freedom on another, it's wrong. If the other is judging and condemning the latter for their freedom, their judgment's not based on biblical truth. The big idea Paul wants to get across is just because your conscience leads you to do something does not always mean it's the same for everyone, especially if it's small matters around this. And see, once we realize that, it frees us up. Once we realize that, you know, others aren't always going to see things the way that we do, it frees us up to be able to show grace and to be able to love them well. See, the most important value is not just about being right. I mean, we should worry about truth and things like that. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying we let go. Core things are absolutely essential. But on these secondary things where it's just so much division and strife comes from, as soon as we're able to kind of let go of those things and not worry so much about being right, but instead of being loving toward that other person, we'll realize that's how we become free. And it's not until we get to the point that I'm willing to even maybe sometimes lay down my rights, lay down the way I want to do things out of love and servitude to this other person. It's then and only then that we're finally going to experience freedom. We pray with me. Father, God, I thank you for your word. <sighs> Though sometimes it's a hard word, it's a tough word, that these tensions are sometimes hard to manage. When we have to learn how to, that it's not, <sighs> it's not just about is it right or wrong, but is it loving or not? Is it wise or not? That sometimes there's a tension that has to be walked it calls for wisdom. It calls for maturity. It calls for power from your spirit because we can't do it on our own. And so, Father, I pray with a message like this, this is not something that we respond to at an altar on a Sunday morning. This is something that we live in the way that we practice and love one another. That it's how we treat each other, especially when we may not see eye to eye on these secondary things. 
that's where the rubber meets the road. God, help us to live in a way that I don't elevate my rights or my freedom is the supreme thing that determines what I do, but instead I view love, sacrifice for others, the heart of the gospel, that I view those as the primary determinant on how I respond to people who differ from me especially within the community of Christ. God, help us to love each other well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Will you stand with me?